Okay, welcome everyone. Today we'll have a webinar about the human risk in cybersecurity. Uh, we think this is one of the most important things and the most important risk in cybersecurity. And today we want to approach how you can make your employees your first line of defense rather than them being the risk factor within your organization. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, we're going to talk about a little bit about us, about Trust Cubes, about the speakers that we'll be hosting today together with uh, Nick from Bockfish. And then we'll go into the actual topic where we try to keep it very educational, talking a little bit about this human risk in cybersecurity. We'll talk a little bit about the problem that needs to be solving, how you can create a cyber safe culture for your business or school, how you can identify these high risk users within your organization, how you then can encourage the learning by actually doing. Then we'll go a little bit more in depth how you can automate this learning program. And finally, we're going to tell you how much this really costs right? because it's not that expensive as a lot of people might think. And at the end, we'll have a session with uh, where you can ask your questions and we'll do answers. So during the course of this webinar in the webinar platform, you will see a Q&A button. So during the course of this webinar, whenever you have a question, just type in the question there. We, we will not see those questions until the end of the webinar, but at the end of the webinar, we'll look at all the questions and we'll ask them there. So, uh, so I will have a look at them. Next slide, please. Okay, so who am I? I'm Johan Bloeme, a founder and CEO of uh, TrustCube, started TrustCubes three years ago. I uh, really wanted to do something more around certificate management, uh, PKI, and then actually expanding into a whole wide range of uh, cybersecurity solution. Uh, my background, I would say, is mostly in PKI, but then I formed myself as an information security professional. I carry certificates like the ISO 27001, Lead Implementer, and so on. So I worked a long time at Global Fine as VP of Sales for EMEA. Next slide. And then with us today, we'll have Nick Deacon Elliott, uh, VP of Sales and Operations of uh, Bogfish. Uh, Nick is a co-owner of Budgets. He leads the operational and commercial team. He has over 12 years experience in the IT sector. He worked with a lot of Fortune 100 companies, local SMEs. And he's now proud, actually, to be on this forefront of human cyber risk. And when you will have the presentation from Nick, you see that he's really passionate about this. So. Next slide. Okay, a little bit about Trust Cubes. People who regularly attend uh, the webinar, they will, will know these slides of people who know us as a company. So what we want to do as Trust Cubes, we want to give you a layered approach to cybersecurity. So our technology areas, we refer to as cubes. And if you think about building your wall of defense yeah, against cyber threats, then you need to have a little bit of different tubes, which varies from different organizations. Now, today we'll talk a little bit more about uh, security awareness training. Now, this is a cube that actually every single organization will need, right? So it doesn't matter if you're a school, a large organization, a small organization. This is something every organization out there will need. Next slide. So really short about the cubes, we started actually in SSL and PKI, PKI management. We have a web security uh, platform as well, where we do some firewall, uh, website firewall, malware, vulnerability scanning. We do document signing. We do remote KYC in the digital age, where you can onboard customers by just taking a selfie and uh, having them upload their identity documents. Next slide. Today we'll talk about security awareness, so I'll, I'll leave that for today. We have a GFC platform, so if you want to go to ISO 27001 certified, this is a very good software to use to actually make sure that you tick all boxes. One of the main boxes in a, in a GRC and an ISO 27001 implementation is going to be security awareness. Yeah? So that's one of the tick boxes that we'll talk about today. We have a secure email uh, solution. We did a very nice webinar about the number one cybersecurity threat, which is business email compromise, where a secure email solution is a very uh, good solution to cover that. 
And then we have so much more. We didn't mention everything here, but we do, for example, red teaming exercises with a, with a bank, for example. Uh, so if there is something in the cybersecurity field what you need, uh, please reach out to us. We'll, we'll probably be able to help you. Next slide. So uh, we have quite a lot of partners across the globe, but we have a few partners that we mention especially, which are uh, our preferred partners or strategic partners in the region. So if you attend this webinar from one of these regions, then our partner, uh, our local partner will reach out to you to follow up. Uh, so in India, that is ECAPS, uh, that is going to follow up in Bangladesh, it's DACA Distributions, in Malaysia, it's BitShield, and in Chile, it's Securita Americas. Next slide. Okay, and then before I give the, the mic over to, to Nick, this, these are all our customers. So as you can see, we have quite a lot of customers across the globe, quite large organization, going from government organization to smaller organizations, a lot of energy companies as well. So just as an intro, when we were building out the company a little bit more in depth about cybersecurity, the first thing we wanted to add is a cybersecurity awareness and phishing simulation platform. And that's when we actually did a very big investigation to find out who is the best fit for us and our customers and our partners. And then we came across of Bogfish. And we think Bogfish is a really nice solution. It's also very nice priced, quite competitive priced. So we think this is really a nice fit. And you will see a little bit more about that today. So Nick, I will uh, hand it over to you. Thanks, Johan. Uh, thank you for the introduction and, and thanks everybody for joining the seminar today. So really excited to um, to get going. And, and what we're going to be looking at today is really around what businesses can be doing to create cyber safe culture. So how can we get some of the best practices uh, carried out by your end users? How can we make sure that people are reporting suspicious emails and doing the due diligence predominantly around an inbox and and online so we're going to look at a few things we're going to look at what the, the the threat and problem is out there we're going to look at some measures and processes we can follow to kind of reduce the human cyber risk and then i'm just going to give you a 10 minute overview of of how we would approach a awareness training and phishing simulation program so I think first and foremost, let's look at the threat level. And it's it's safe to say that over the last, particularly the last 12 months, there's been an enormous spike in activity for cybercrime. A lot of business people compromise, ransomware. You know, you go on the news anywhere in the world every single day and there's a another company that has been hit and hit hard. And I think what we're seeing is two things. We're seeing the level of sophistication on the... Uh, cyber attacks increasing significantly so finding ways to slip through the net of the systems um, and also we're seeing the cost to clean up uh, is is getting very significant and two sides on that there's the the actual true cost of often maybe paying ransomware or, or, or putting things right but then there's the more difficult cost to quantify around the the loss of reputation and, and potentially the loss of future business so what we're seeing is the people that have the reduced kind of reputation and mitigating that is by being quite open and, and clean with with people when they have been hacked so kind of revealing that they have been but they had these measures in place this is the the route to fix and the route to resolve this is what's been leaked so it's kind of the people that are more transparent about it we, we've certainly seen have less of a damaging kind of reputation and one of the things that we want to make sure that happens is that when you're um, going through your processes, as Johan mentioned too earlier, that we're not forgetting about the people and the people element of your of your cybersecurity posture. So we know there's a threat out there. We know it's getting uh, more difficult for businesses. What can we do about it? And I think what, what I like to do is I just like to start with um, a question. Now, I'm not going to put this to a poll, but I'll, I'll go straight to the answer. But I want us to start thinking about it. So what percentage of cyber attacks are caused by human error? And I'm going to jump straight to the answer. So 95%, and this is the key word, of all successful cyber attacks are caused by human error. So what we're referring to here is ones that actually make an impact, actually cause damage, cause kind of 
sweat and tears. Um, the successful ones, there's an element of human error in a huge majority of them. And this was a pretty in-depth study by IBM. So it's credible data. So what we're looking at here is not the ones that are stopped by a system layer and the web filters, the firewalls, all the antivirus, etc. What we're talking about is the ones that slip the net of the systems and then your only kind of defense on them being successful or not is a human knowing what to do with it. And what we're trying to do is Johan really kind of uh, clearly articulated at the beginning of the seminar was make make the last line super strong, make them a really good defense mechanism. So we're going to come on to how we do that in a short while. But before we um, come on to any of the how, I think it's important to just look at a few stats. And there's three stats that, that specifically stick out to me. The first one is that 74% of all cyber attacks start at the inbox. So what we need to think before we start trying to address the people problem is anything we do needs to be focused or at least have a lot of focus around inbox health. So inbox safety, are people checking the links? Are they checking attachments? Are they checking the from name? Is there lots of urgency in the content of the email? So really start kind of driving that best practice and we need to make sure we're focusing as a priority at the inbox level. The next thing we've seen is account takeover. So albeit um, the... Johan, can I just ask you to mute yourself? Sorry, I'm just getting a bit of repeat. Yeah. Thank so, so what we're seeing from a, a, an account takeover perspective is that the the damage caused by them is significant. So, somebody getting into your Microsoft 365, getting into your inbox, getting into your Google infrastructure can be seriously painful for a business. So, what we what we want to do is make sure we've got some ideas of around how we can replicate who are the likely people to fall for account takeover. So I'll come on to that a, a little bit later, but albeit only represents 14%, it's super, super damaging if, if it's successful. And then the final piece on this slide is seven out of 10 businesses currently don't invest in this human cyber risk program, which to me is, is pretty crazy. So businesses will spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, on the cybersecurity posture at a system level, but then completely forget about the people. And if you think around a good strategy, you need the processes, the systems and the people. Not saying it has to be an even level of investment but you can't forget about your people and a lot of our customers that come to work with us we're not displacing other systems they just haven't done anything so so what we're trying to do is really encourage businesses to make sure they don't forget about their staff i'm just going to kick on to the next slide so what we're going to do now is just look at three examples of pretty significant cyber attacks that could have been stopped by some better or in my opinion by better staff training so i've decided against revealing who the organization is because i don't i didn't think that was fair but um i've got the sector that they operate and so the first one was a household electronics brand that we will have all probably all got something in our house made by this company um, and it was attack that started via a phishing email and, and led to a download of malware. And as a result, there was a leak of 100 terabytes of data, which, you know, is, is, is pretty horrendous. But it was more what was in the data that was uh, seriously challenging. So staff salaries, bonuses, very personal information pension pots pension investments but this company also make movies and there was a movie script released so one that had yet to be released so kind of really confidential information and the cleanup of the uh, attack was in excess of a hundred million dollars um and all started by somebody at an inbox clicking something they shouldn't have done. So, you know, if there was just some of the due diligence done at hovering over the link, if you weren't expecting the email, pick up the phone and contact the sender, check its authenticity, you know, we'll never know. But would this attack have been successful without that end user that initially engaged in that inbox uh, on the on the wrong link? Could that have saved the company $100 million? Well, quite possibly, yes, but it's a the human error was the last line on this one and it failed the next one i think is 
it is really bad from an emotional point of view. So um, this wasn't really anything in terms of engaging on a link or or, or downloading that something uh, something that shouldn't have been downloaded. It was more just a lack of diligence and care. So there was a medical company that sent an email to 750 people um, detailing a list of uh patients that had recently been diagnosed with hiv so you know incredibly sensitive data and they sent it to the wrong data set they sent it to a newsletter by accident a newsletter um email chain so could systems have stopped that well well maybe they could because there are some software out there that kind of double check that you want to send attachments but more just training on if it is a sensitive attachment double triple check or is there a safer way of transferring that data does it have to go on an email that could be compromised anyway because it is such sensitive information so you know there was a huge loss of reputation for this medical company um and it could have been avoided the systems didn't let them down it was the human error on that element so a kind of different style so we've seen phishing we've seen kind of lack of care and then the final one, which which Johan alluded to as well, is kind of business email compromise. So so this one really baffles me. So um, there was a technology business that uh, had a £46 million transfer intercepted via a, um, well, there was a compromise in the email and then a spoof payment application. They were able to recover about £8 million of that, but £38 million pound transfer into the into the wrong account via a, an intercept on the way so you know could that have been stopped by just double checking things like the, the domains the links um checking the emails hadn't been uh, sorry the email had been spoofed or compromised there was certainly some human error that let them down along the way um again if the inbox safety was where it should have been would that have happened quite possibly not um, so what we're trying to do is really reduce the risk of human error across these successful attacks. So there's three examples. But I think we need to have a look at the good news. And the good news is that um, people can learn pretty quickly. You can start implementing new habits and behaviours pretty quickly as well. So within weeks, we can see a dramatic de-risk position for end users as long as there's a, a good programme put in place. So we're now going to start looking at at what that looks like so um at boxfish one of the first things we say is what are we trying to achieve and i think in fact johan mentioned it at the beginning of the the seminar so there's compliant led awareness program so maybe an iso twenty seven thousand say that you need to do some cyber awareness training so okay we can tick that box that we have done an annual training or, or some relatively regular training but that's only going to get you so far from a compliance led so what what we want to do is drive up the value chain. So how can we start shaping that behavior? How can we start in, encouraging kind of the best practices? So reporting fish, deleting the emails, not, not engaging. If there's lots of urgency in the emails, kind of picking up the phone to check authenticity, speak with your IT if you think you've clicked something that you shouldn't have done. And you know, it's much easier like with anything, the earlier you spot that something has gone wrong, the less time there is to do damage. So kind of really encouraging some of those best practices. As we move kind of up to a two and a one where we're going to start seeing some of that business impact and true value, there's going to be a bit more focus and effort involved. But once the program's underway, these these things can run themselves pretty, pretty efficiently. So we're going to come on to that shortly. But the key message is define your why. What are you trying to achieve? And then we have a process that we adhere to at Boxfish that it's quite simple you know we don't see this as a massively complex uh problem to solve it just needs a process that works and and most importantly it it to run consistently that's kind of the key to any forming of new habits so what we do is uh we look at four different pillars so pillar one is identify and i'll go through all of these in a bit more detail pillar two is educate pillar three is analyze and the final one is repeat so what we want to do at the beginning is start off by identifying who those high risk users are. So that could be an individual in your kind of internal ecosystem. It could be specific departments. It could be um, if you're a, an umbrella of companies, it could even be a specific company within your group. So who is the pe who are the people within my kind of ecosystem 
that are higher risk. So we need to identify those first because that enables us to go and target our efforts at, the, at those guys as a priority. The next piece is around the education. So how can we get the information into our end users so, so they know what good looks like, so they know how to behave safely, give them the tools to be safe on your behalf. And then we're collecting a ton of really meaningful data throughout pillars one and two. So how can we represent that and present that back in a way to the senior decision makers, the senior business leaders to make decisions based on risk score? So things like rolling out multi-factor authentication, for example, if it can't be done in a big bang, well, who do we target first? Well, a good place to start would be your highest risk users or when you're, you've got repeat offenders that are consistently high risk, can we go and make sure access control is absolutely right for them, that they haven't got any access to systems that they shouldn't have? Because we know if these guys get compromised or targeted, they're more likely to get compromised than anybody else. And then finally, how can we build this into part of our company DNA? So that starts at getting it on the board. So this you know, cyber risk and, and date, potential data leaks, cyber compromise should be reviewed at the top level with a, with a, within a company. It should be something that's reported on regularly. And then the program and process of reducing that human risk element needs to form part of our company's DNA. So how can we do that? So they're the four pillars. Now I'm going to just try bring all of this together a little bit by showing um, how how we can do it. So it all starts with uh, a plan. So we need a good plan with anything that's got to be successful. We, we need to identify what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it. We want to build uh, the identify phase, so the fish phase, the simulated attack phase, super relevant um, to your organization. So we're going to cover that. We want to show some content and, and um, learning material that's really engaging for the end user. And our, our personal opinion at Boxfish is that it's got to be really kind of short and sweet. So um, three, four, five minute long, absolute maximum in terms of a training course. So it's bite size, but delivered regularly. So monthly, monthly intervals. And then we'll drop into an example of the human risk report. So the plan. One of the things that um, we see in successful cyber attacks is uh, obviously the sophistication uh, is huge and also the amount of research now is is pretty significant. So um, gone are the days where a kind of email all with a click here for a free iPod or something and that starts a ton of worms. You know, they're, they're getting very, very limited in terms of their success because it's all stopped by a system layer. So what we're seeing is people or, or hackers doing the social engineering, looking at people's behaviors, doing the research into the applications you're running um, so they can make sure any kind of particularly uh, business email compromise attacks are relevant and tailored to your, your applications that your end users are used to working with. So what we need to do as part of the kind of the simulation and, and identify phase is to make sure that what we're sending out is relevant as well. So we need to do the level of research that a hacker would or cyber criminal would do. So that starts off with some simple questions such as, are you Microsoft or Google? Do you use Sage, Zero, QuickBooks? Do you use Slack or Ring Central? You know, these building up this kind of view of what applications we want to start simulating in your in your user base based on things that people are used to. So here's an example of one that we prepared for. Uh, this was for a college actually in, in the UK um, that use Microsoft. They have some users on LinkedIn. They use 365 a lot. Um, sorry, the, the Teams and the file share Microsoft 365. Obviously, loads of people using Amazon now. So we built a really tailored phishing journey. And by doing this up front, what it enables us to do, as Johan mentioned, is run a program really efficiently from a time perspective well both a cost and a time perspective so we agree kind of 12 simulations that we want to uh, target over over the first 12 months and the next thing we want to do is is overlay that with a learning journey so we've done our simulation journey now it's an education so what's important to us now 
going back to the 74% of email start at the inbox, we've got to start looking at how can we get people to spot fish, to not overshare online, to spot invoices that don't look quite right, to avoid ransomware. So we would typically start a learning journey at the beginning, um, all with that kind of content. So bite-sized courses on each specific area. And then that would run in parallel to the simulated fish. So I'm just going to show a couple of examples now of what, what they look like. So to the untrained user, uh, hopefully you guys can see that okay. Uh, it might be a little bit small, but I'll talk through it anyway. So to an untrained user, that doesn't look too far off. So it's got the right colors. It's got a logo. It's addressed to me. Um, however, to a, to a trained user, they would know to check the following. So the domain, yes, it's spoofed, but it doesn't look a legitimate LinkedIn. So it's info at no reply dash LinkedIn verify.co.uk. So it looks kind of relatively accurate, but it's certainly not authentic. Um, there's a spelling error here. Verify is spelt uh, wrong for, for what it should do. If you were to hover over the links, it would take you back to a Boxfish uh, website, not a LinkedIn site. So what we're trying to do is if you get an email that you weren't expecting that feels a bit, your gut feel just isn't, this is normal, is to check that detail. So check the authenticity of the domain, check for spelling and grammar errors, hover over the links, and if in doubt, pick up the phone. So you can see here that a really easy giveaway would be for an end user to hover over that link and just, you know, it's obvious it's not going to LinkedIn landing page. Um, the other things we can do is encourage if you've got an email like this from LinkedIn, don't go via the email, go via the, the web browser, go to your LinkedIn profile. And if it prompts you to reset your security settings, then maybe it was legitimate, but certainly don't access it from your from your email and that's kind of similar for netflix or anything like that is to to make sure you go to the source of the website so what we can do now is i've just gone to a 404 so in the early days of a of a program what we want to do is we want to run these simulations um kind of almost under the radar so we don't want to alert end users to a significant amount of um or, or, of simulation internally because it can start off a few things so people you know there's the entrapment side are my it team trying to trick me out um there's a lot of anxiety in the world as it as it is with 2020 just being the year it's been so we want to just for now in the early two or three simulations do white pages or 404s so it's it's done kind of under the radar but then what we can do once we've built up that what is my risk score based on th two, three, four simulations? We can then position that there's a training program we put in place, and then we can start changing the strategy with, with what we're doing as people engage. So I'm just gonna show one more example because I think this is really useful. So something I alluded to at the beginning of the seminar was the, the damage that account takeovers can cause or, or kind of, usernames passwords being leaked so i'm going to show a simulation now which is a two-stage simulation so what we're looking at here is people that engage in an email that they shouldn't uh, engage with and then secondly who's willing to share something on a website that isn't legitimate so here's an example so this is uh, just eat it's a food service in the uk a bit similar to delivery or uber um, or hungry house that kind of style so i've had a voucher delivered to me which is great so i want to hit use now that's going to take me to a website where it's asking me to input some information so in this particular example enter my work email address and then i would hit download here and that would give me a voucher well it wouldn't obviously because it's it's a it's a fish it's going to tell me that i've engaged with something i shouldn't have done but that should in theory give you a 10 pound voucher so these two stage simulations are really powerful for identifying out of my high risk users who are my really really high risk users so if you think this could be a just eat voucher it could be an uber credit it could be a microsoft password reset where it asks you for your current password and, and to set a new password or a Google uh, password reset. So what we're trying to do is work out in terms of the risk funnel, the people that go through the email, then to the landing page are the highest risk possible. They are the repeat offenders typically and ones that are willing to share information without spotting things like the domain. 
Um, so really powerful simulation to run to identify your high risk users. And then once the training program has been positioned, we can start being a little bit more direct with some of our kind of in experience from, from an end user. So this is as direct as you're going to get. So this is you've been caught out, simulated by Boxfish. You should have looked at these things. Now, often we co-brand this with a customer detail. So it kind of looks that it's a, a genuine training program. Or we can also make it so it auto enrolls you onto a, a, a little training course. So, for example, if the threat was account takeover and you were engaged, then you would then have to sit a course, two, three minute long course on how to spot account takeover. Or if it was spear phishing, how to spot uh, spear phishing. So, so we can we have complete choice over what we show end users. And our, our guidance, just to surmise, is start with quite under the radar quite sort of kind of um unnoticeable really white pages 404s then as we move through the journey get a bit more direct with what we're showing our end users so that's the identify piece covered the next bit we want to look at is educate so how can we get some of this best practice and behavioral change into our end users and uh, we host a learning management system. So we have these bite-sized courses as a mix of videos, infographics, quizzes um, that are delivered monthly or at least a, a li really no longer than quarterly. Some customers do three a quarter, but ideally it's one a month. But the idea being that these little kind of bite-sized courses make cyber stay at the front of mind of people's uh, decision making. So I'm just going to share really quickly, like a 30, 40 second minute clip. Now, we we're not going to get audio through on the video, I don't think, because of the way we're sharing. So I'll just let it run and then I'll talk through it a little bit. So what we've got here is an example of a 2D animated course. Um, and it's based on a simple four pillar structure. So I'm just going to pause that there, actually. So a four pillar structure. So um, what's the threat, how it can get you, what you can do to avoid it and what an example looks like. And we spend roughly 30 seconds on each of those sections and it's across multiple threat vectors. So ransom, what's ransomware? how we how it can get you what we can do to avoid it what it looks like in real life and similar to ceo fraud spear phishing and that kind of gives the right level of information so it's jargon free delivered regularly but it what it enables us to do by going down the 2d animation route is build really tailored journeys so it doesn't matter if you're in Bangladesh or if you're in Germany or UK or Greece or Sweden because it's 2D we can really easily put um, different languages over the top so whether that's as simple as subtitles or a local voice artist perhaps we can make sure that the the training is really relevant to the end user rather than just a UK speaking video and that's certainly something that's helped us as we've expanded globally. When I share this, by the way, is the part of the follow up, you will be able to hit, listen to the audio. And also, if you go to our website, there's some example videos there. OK, so we've we talked about the bite size automated learning journey. Now, what can we do with the data we're collecting? So um, I've just got a snapshot here of something we, we refer to as the human risk report. And I think that this is really powerful uh, information. So what it's going to do is it's going to tell me as an IT leader or a business leader, what my company risk score. So that's based on an algorithm that we have in the back end of our platform. Um, the key kind of factor on the risk score is the percentage of engagement with simulation. So what's our propensity to engage with these simulated attacks? Um, we can then see below what simulations have gone out to my end users. So Amazon, Deliveroo, Just Eat. Uh, Microsoft password resets, file shares, we can see kind of what's gone out into our network, what's working. To the right hand side, we can see which ones are getting the most engagement. So, you know, if there's lots of Microsoft in there, we, we know that we need to do some specific how to spot kind of fraudulent Microsoft um, logins, file shares, password resets. And then down in the bottom left, we can see 
who are our high risk users. Now, now this is a print screen from an online portal. So obviously in an online portal, you can filter the data and play around with it a bit more. But what we're able to see is the people are the repeat offenders. So that's really, really powerful. So is there somebody in accounts or somebody in HR or somebody in sales that is repeatedly engaging with these simulations? Because if so, firstly, we want to see, are they doing their courses? Are they doing the content? Are they doing the training? And if they're not, then the, the conversation is super easy. So you need to go do your training because you've engaged with some simulations which aren't good for, for anybody. And we can identify kind of an individual risk score as well. So we can filter that based on who am I. You might be fine with anyone being an A and a B, for example, but I want to see everybody that's a C and below. And then we've got in the bottom right kind of the month on month risk score. So as a group, are we are we turning that risk score down? Are we driving that down? So really useful report to get. This is available real time and also it would be delivered monthly um, to make those decisions. And then one of the things that, that Johan mentioned again at the beginning of the seminar was um, the cost to run these programs. So compared to typical cyber and IT projects, these are super, super high value. So um, there's two costs, I suppose. There's the cost of time and then there's the true cost of money and, and investment. So the first one we'll look at is time. So for us to run an effective human risk program or human risk reduction program, we need about two hours a year from an admin and about one hour a year from an end user. And the end user one hour is 12 five minute courses. And then the admin time is kind of a 50, circa 15, 10, 15 minutes per month to just review the program, review the results. Um, there's integrations with kind of Office 365 and Google. So the admin's very light in terms of delivering the courses and we control that anyway. So there's not a big time resource required for these programs. And then when we look at kind of what does it take from a money perspective? So, um, there's an analogy that I use that I think works relatively well is is a cup of coffee and there isn't really any senior manager I wouldn't have thought that wouldn't think twice about buying somebody in their team a cup of coffee once a month. So our solutions cost about a third of a cup of coffee per employee per month. So from a relatively speaking from a business perspective and an IT perspective, it's really, really cost effective. So we've got well, Johan can provide more detailed pricing, but but anywhere from kind of 60p per user per month up to kind of £1.50, dependent on scale and level of, of, of service and feature taken. But it's really effective commercial models. And that's it. So hopefully that's been useful. I'm going to hand back to Johan, um, but really enjoyed covering those kind of key topics. And if there's any questions, we'll pick them up. Thank you so much, Nick. This was super informative. This was super good. I'm going to have a look if there are questions. So people, if you have questions, uh, please use the Q&A box. Uh, you can see. I, I see here Manoj said uh, on the first question, uh, he, he guessed 90% uh, while it was 95. So I think this is a very good guess. It was quite close to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very close. So it's something I want to mention because I see that there are a lot of resellers of ours as well uh, attending this webinar. So this is something every customer you already have needs, right? Uh, you're already helping them with their SSL certificates or their network security. Uh, this is the first thing you have to have in place if you think about your cybersecurity defense and every organization needs it, whether you're big, whether you're small. So you already have that trust relationship with your customers. So this is something they need. A lot of customers, what I noticed myself, they come in because they think we need it compliance wise. But as Nick mentioned, this is, this is not the reason why you should have it. This is sometimes the reason why they start looking for it. Yep, to tick that box in, in the compliance part. But the reason why you should actually have it is because this is the number one threat and this is the number one line of defense. Yeah. Uh, that you need to have in place. So I, I liked Nick's his last slide where he explained actually what this costs. This is, and also if you compare this to competitors, this is super cheap. 
yeah, the platform and also not very time consuming. You have other platforms where you have very long, boring videos, which people don't look at. So I would recommend people to, to give this a try because the videos are so short, educative, very, very engaging. Uh, that's, that's what we really liked when we were uh, assessing this, uh, this tool. Okay, Nick, I'm going to go through the, the questions. So one question we have here is uh, we have someone who is a, a global IT manager and he's wondering for his teams in, in different regions how you would approach it language-wise, uh, if that's possible. Yeah, th thanks, Johan. Yeah, so um, there's two things that we would look to do is we would uh, firstly understand what is the primary language used across the group um, and then kind of secondly um are there some specific languages that would be specifically um useful to to include and one of the things that we've done if we well i think by standard now in local dialect we've got arabic bangla english and german and then lots of subtitles so what we would do is if there was a gap in there um subtitles we can include in any language kind of free of charge and then if there's a business case to get a local voice artist so somebody with a local tongue a very you know relevant dialect we would actually get the content re-recorded and our video editing team would would overlay the um the language onto the video so it would be a very relevant and tailored experience for the end users so in so, so to summarize any any language is possible yeah and i'll add to this it's not uh it's not that we're going to first enable the most spoken languages in the world we do it very much customer uh, driven so for example we already have bangla a uh, language in bangladesh we have that available because that was customer driven right uh, so it depends, whatever your customer needs, we can get it in place. If there is a customer behind us, we are willing to do that, right? That's mm -hmm. correct, Nick. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, uh, and then an, another question I have here, let me have a look. Okay, yeah, so here's the question. How do you compare against the competition? So, um... <laughs> So the the thing that Boxfish is focused on is making sure the programs are run consistently. So um, there's lots of our competitors out there will provide you with a software toolkit. So a platform where you can uh, go and run these programs yourself. And what we've we've seen is that um, yes, what we're doing is very important for an IT manager, but it's not necessarily urgent. And what I mean by that is if your network goes down or if your web filters and firewalls stop allowing traffic to sites or your email server goes down, these things take significant urgency over running a training program, for example. Not saying that they're any different on kind of an importance level, so to speak, but the urgency they do. So what we like to do is, or what we've centered the business around is actually saying it doesn't matter how busy the end user is in the IT department or what gets thrown at them that day, the training is going to go out to your end users, the simulations will go out. So we've invested heavily in our automation engine to take away any admin for, for, for an end user, for an IT end user. So I would say that's really our key differentiator is that the program kind of runs itself. Yeah. And I, I would say if you look at the cost, as you said very nicely in the presentation, cost consists in two things, the time spent, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what it actually costs. And if you look at the cost, I think you're very competitive price compared to the competition. But then yeah. also you do this automation, you take away a lot of time in managing this. Uh, I know even organizations that, uh, that actually try to build their own cybersecurity awareness program, right? Yes. Uh, like so much time uh, and effort while they could just spend like you said uh, not even one cup of coffee uh, per employee right one third of a cup of coffee and they uh, they would get this whole solution yeah. so yeah. When, when we did this analysis and comparing uh, a lot of uh, different uh, providers right we we like that about you and what we also liked about you is the reporting I think you have very comprehensive reporting, both on the company level and both on the individual level. 
which is also quite key, which not everyone has. So yes, yeah. Just what okay. I wanted to add. Yeah. Okay, so one one final question. If someone has a question, then please type it uh, in in the question and a book. Otherwise, this is going to be the last question for today, and then we'll we'll end this webinar. So the last question is: If we want to get started, how do we how do we get started? What is the process? Okay, cool. So the process is um, to onboard. So it starts with a onboarding call with uh, one of our product managers, um, who will basically understand what applications are being used in your environment so the questions like the are you using google are you using microsoft what finance system do you use what crm so we can build up that really relevant kind of experience for your end users so we would design that it takes maybe 15 20 minutes to have that call and then uh, we would integrate to the admin from the Microsoft 365 or Google, or if you're not using either of those, we would get kind of your first name, last name email. So basically get your users into our platform. And then we agree a cadence of learning. So what do we want to teach our people when? And then we hit a start date. So, you know, our, our typical onboarding times uh, from start to finish would be less than one week. Um, where we'd expect to be able to get this up and running. And that's kind of to allow, there's maybe an hour and a half of calls and then it's a bit of back and forth kind of deciding what things look like and, and what we're going with. And then we get up and running so that they're pretty quick to onboard. Thank you very much. Well, what I like very much about what you just said is that it's tailored to the customer. It's not like one training program fits every organization. It's really much tailored to that organization it's like a managed service and they can use the components and do what they want themselves right yes that's I really right. have that. it's very nice so i reading a question here do you have any question from a bank to be asked from the customer is there a typical question that bank customers ask i think that's the question is there uh, is there a typical well, the question, right? Do you have any question, bank, to be asked from the customer? That's how it's written. What I do. do um, have... okay. Maybe can you rephrase that because I I don't really. Do Do you get the question, Nick? Oh, I, I think so. So I think um, kind of are there any specifics for banks? So so when we're onboarding finance houses, the usual questions are, you know, where's the data stored? What secure perimeter security do we have um you know what's the level of security to the data i think we're not holding a huge amount of sen sensitive data anyway uh it's more of an integration into kind of microsoft 365 so um it is delivered via the cloud i think this is the question so it's delivered via the cloud um but we're not storing tons of personal information so from a kind of compliance and due diligence point of view uh we, we usually sail through through that okay i'm just quickly asking did, did this answer your question can you just type in the box yes or no that would be nice okay and then i see here it's not a question nick but it's someone saying thanks it was a very nice session oh, okay so thank you very much Okay, so I think that's it for today. So Nick, I want to thank you enormously for today. This was so educational and uh, to everyone who attended, thank you for joining. We will be following up with uh, some emails where you will have the recorded version of this session as well. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you afterwards as well. So you can reach out to us if you want to get started with this or you want to start reselling this. Uh, we're happy to have that conversation at any time. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Johan. Thanks, have a nice day. Thanks, bye. bye.